as you sit there this evening, let's just bow our heads and, and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Father, we want to thank you tonight for another privilege that you have, Lord, to, to gather in your name, to gather around your word, Lord, and to hear what it is that you have got to say for us, Lord. Lord, you have done it since the beginning of time. You have spoken to your people. And Lord, we can honestly, with hands raised this evening, we can raise our hands and we can say, Lord, we, we didn't listen. But Father, we know that we serve a mighty, merciful, graceful God. And we want to thank you for that, Lord. And we want to thank you for the service. Bless every single person here, Lord. Bless the rest of this service. And I pray, Lord, that you'll watch over the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, that it'll be found acceptable unto thee, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. This evening, well, it's actually the start of a short two-week little uh, sermon series called Restoration and Renovation. Now, I spoke to a friend of mine in the week, and he said to me, but he says, it's the same thing, man. How can you speak about the same thing for two weeks? It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing, and I'm going to give you some background now. But the biggest thing is, you know what, when it comes to restoration, or the way that I believe, is you first need to be, and of course we're talking about us and God, you first need to be restored in your relationship with God before the renovation can start taking place. Are you with me? You can say amen, it's not a sin. You can say amen, I believe you. Now what I want to talk about tonight, and there's going to be no scriptures on the, on the screens this evening, all that we're going to do is we're going to speak about the entire book of Hosea. Who's ever read the book of Hosea? Okay, so for the rest of you, there's homework for next week. Go and read the book of Hosea. It's not a long book. It's actually a very interesting book. And it's one of those books, and you'll see it this evening, where the gospel of Jesus Christ metaphorically just jumps at you. And it just grabs hold of you. Now, just a little bit of background on the book of Hosea before I throw my notes away. Um, the book of Hosea is one of 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. Okay, it was written at about, or between 760 and 720 BC. Uh, and it takes place during a, a very dark and melancholic time or an era for the nation of Israel. The northern, the northern kingdom, because at that time the, the kingdoms divided, the northern kingdom find, the, find themselves in a place where they started worshipping the, the, the golden calves of Jeroboam and Baal. They have sort of moved away from the law that was given to them in the desert by Moses, and they have fallen by the wayside. In other words, they've moved away from God. And they moved out of the will of God. Now at this time, the prophet Hosea comes and he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he speaks and he prophesies over them. Because in those years, the Lord spoke to, or God spoke to the prophet, and the prophet spoke to the people. That's how it worked. And God speaks to Hosea, and Hosea speaks to the nation of Israel. And he says to them, he says, listen, unless you repent of these sins... Unless you repent of these sins, God will allow the nation to be destroyed and the people will be taken into, uh, into exile by the Assyrians. Now, like I, like I said, they have fallen by the wayside at this time and they've actually, they were, they were misled by the kings of the northern kingdom and their, there's no better way to say it, their aristocratic followers and also by the priests. So they found themselves in a very, very dark an overwhelming place. And now, although this prophecy is a bit hairy and hectic, uh, we see that it centers around God's love for the nation of Israel. Now, to understand the, the book of Hosea, um, you need to, almost because it speaks in metaphors, um, but to understand it perfectly or, or well or better, you need to understand two things very well. Whenever in the book of Hosea we speak about Hosea, it is a metaphor for God. And when we speak about his, his sinful, adulterous uh, uh, wife, her name is Goma. What a, what a name. I don't know. Maybe it means not loved. No, it doesn't. We'll get to that now. When, uh, when we hear the, the name Goma, 
it means or it portrays metaphorically the nation of Israel. Okay, so you got that. When we speak of Hosea, it's God, and when we speak of Gomer, we're speaking about the nation of Israel. So throughout the Bible, God goes and he gives a lot of prophets a lot of tasks. But I think out of all of them, Hosea is the one that got, if I may say that, the most ludicrous task out of all of them. God comes to Hosea, and I'm going to paraphrase. God comes to Hosea, and he says to Hosea, Hosea, I want you to marry a harlot. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, you know what? God coming to the man of God, he's, he's someone that is respected within his community. He's someone that is used by God to speak the word of God that he hears from God to the nation. And the Lord himself comes to this man and he says, Hosea, I want you to go and I want you to marry a prostitute. As if that is not bad enough, he goes and he says, but you know what, just be careful because um, she's not going to be faithful to you. But I want you to marry her. And Hosea, being the obedient man of God, the obedient follower of God, he goes and he finds himself a wife. Her name is Gomer. And he marries her. They have a child and they have a second and a third child. And many of the biblical scholars say this. The second and the third child did not belong to Hosea. But Hosea stays faithful to his harlot wife. And he remains faithful. Gets to a point where she, let's put it in modern day terms, she ups and she runs off with someone else and she disappears. And for a long time, he doesn't see her, he doesn't know where she is, doesn't know what she's up to. He can only think, because of her background, he can only think what she's up to and what she's busy doing. And it gets to a point where the Lord speaks to Hosea again and he says to him, Hosea, I want you to go find your wife. I don't know, I don't know about you, but you know what? When I put myself in Hosea's shoes, man, I can only think. I can only think what he had to go through in his mind. Was he shameful? Was he worried about what people were going to say? Or what would... But you know what? In all of it, he remains faithful. He remains faithful to what God is telling him to do. And remember... Metaphorically speaking, when we speak about Hosea, we're speaking about God. And Gomer goes and he goes out into the market plain to go find his, his wife. And where does he find her? He finds her on the market plain. And she's being sold. Many says that the man that she was with... Um, didn't want anything to do with her anymore, so he sold her basically back into that industry. That's what a lot, a lot of biblical scholars believe. Hosea is standing there with a mandate from God, knowing that this is what my God said that I need to do. He goes and he puts in the highest bidder. But hold on. <laughs> there's, there's something wrong here. Something's not right. She already belongs to him. It's his wife. It's his wife. But he's there under, under instruction from God. And God said, you buy her back. And he places the highest bidder or bid on Hosea. And he purchases her back. Now many of us, if we play this, if we play this out in our minds and we think, you know what? He must have told her exactly where to get off when he got back home. He must have told her, you know what? You will never ever in your life, you. You know what? You know what he did? All he did, he said to her, you will play the harlot no more. And you will be with me until the end of your days. That's it. And we look at this from a modern day perspective. And we look at this from a relational point of view. And we say, but this cannot be. This is, this is ludicrous. This man, it, he's insane. 
He's insane. There must be something wrong with him. How can he just take her back just after what she's done to him, after all the ridicule, after all the, the unfaithfulness? All that he says is, you will be with me until the end of your days. But you know what, friends? I don't know, I don't know about you. I, I said this, and, and this stuff really excites me because you know what? The, wherever I read the Bible and the gospel just jumps out at you and it grabs you by the neck, this is one of those instances where the gospel of Jesus Christ, it jumps up and it grabs you. Because you know what? The whole gospel is taken up in these few short sentences that I just explained to you. You don't believe me? Jesus died on the cross. He was the son of God. And he died on a cross for you and for me. For the remission of sins. So that you and me can stand here today. Believing in the one that is above every other one. Believing and preaching and teaching and guiding and comforting not through our own strength, but through the strength and the ability that He attained, attained for us on the cross. He purchased with His own blood. He purchased a full life for you and for me. You know what the sad thing is if we look at the story and we ask ourselves the questions, you know what? Who's Hosea? Yes, it's God. Who's Gomer? Yes, it's the nation of Israel, but I want to ask you tonight, who's Gomer? It's me. It's you. We are the Gomers of this life. We are the unfaithful ones of this life. You know what, friends? We can say whatever we want. The Bible says clearly, Paul states it so clearly. He says, you cannot say that you have no sin. Because if you say that, the truth is not within you. So daily we need to go before God and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, restore me into a living relationship with you. That restoration part, friends, it can only take place there where you make a decision. There where you make that decision. If we look at, if we look at this beautiful story, and it's, and it's a story, man, that, Sometimes I read it and I, and I sit alone and I, and I burst out in tears. Because again, if you, if you metaphorically look at this, God is speaking almost out of a place of agony to the nation of Israel. And he says to them, please, man, stop going waywards, man. Stop sinning. I was with you in the desert for 40 years. And you walk away and you come back. And you walk away and you come back. And you walk away and you come back. And in those same words that Hosea spoke to Gomer, God is saying to us, stop playing the harlot, man. Stop being like a prostitute over the love that I have given you. Come back to me and stay with me until the end of your days. Come back and have a living relationship with me until the end of your days. Because you know what, friends, we can say what we want, Next week, we're going to talk about the, the, the renovation, and we're going, to, we're going to see some fun stuff in that. But before that, before that renovation can take place, the restoration of the relationship between you and God needs to take place. That restorative process. The, I, I don't know if, if you can remember the last sermon that I preached um, when I had the door up here. He's constantly knocking. He's constantly knocking and he's saying, don't, come back to me, come back to me. I need you to be in a living relationship with me. Because you know what, we are so quick to say, but I know the plans that the Lord has for me. Oh yes, I can quote that scripture. These are not plans to harm me, but it is plans of hope and to give me a good future. Yes, hallelujah brother, hallelujah sister, it's great and it's amazing. But how can you be in that place if you do not have a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what, friends? I think sometimes we, not sometimes, most of the times, we just overcomplicate it. We overcomplicate it completely. 
The Bible says that you need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That God, was, that, that Jesus, that God raised him from the, from, the, from the dead. And then when he was raised up, he ascended to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the Father and he's busy interceding for you and me. The Bible says if you believe that, you are saved. Wow. If we look at the thief on the cross, friends, what a prime, prime, prime example. The thief on the cross is such a beautiful an example. Was he baptized? No. No, he wasn't baptized. Did he go to church? Um, no. I've studied the Bible, and many scholars have studied the Bible, and they couldn't find that he was, that he was even in the least bit connected to any form of religion. He hangs next to Jesus on the cross. And the Lord said to you, do you believe I am who I say I am? And he says, I believe. And right there, Jesus says to him, but today, today, you will sit with me in the kingdom of heaven. Why? One thing. Because he believed. He believed that the man on the middle cross was the son of God. He believed that the man on the middle cross was who he said he was. He was truly the king of the Jews. He was truly the son of God, the son of man, the one who was sent for all of mankind to do a redemptive and a restorative work in every single one of us. So that one day, my very good friends, that day when we all let go of our last breath, that we can be fully restored into his glory. It's so easy. Friends, it's so easy, but yet it's so difficult because we live in this life with all the distractions and all the things going on around us and you know what, we pull to this way and we pull to that side and we, we pull all over the show and we get so busy and we're running and we, we are everywhere. But man, when it comes to opening my Bible in the morning, when it comes to opening my Bible in the evening, when it comes to falling on my knees and saying, Dad, Dad, man, I need you, Dad. I need you, Jesus. I need you to take care of these problems. I need you to take me, to take me to another place, Lord. I need you to restore me and to renew me and to revive me because I cannot do this anymore. When it comes to those things, the things that really matter in life, what do we do? Do we not most of the times play the harlot? And friends, please, 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 I'm not trying to to bring condemnation over you. I'm not speaking death over you. I'm not any. But if we are honest with ourselves, friends, that's what we do. Because I'm too busy. I'm too busy with the, with, with the things of this world to get to the things of my God. And we move it very quickly and abruptly. Like I said, we start playing the harlot and we turn our backs on God and we, and we start walking Wayward. Band, you can come up. Where were you, were you sitting this evening? You, you might be in a place where you say, but you know what? And I cannot do this anymore. I cannot walk with one foot on this side and one foot on the other side anymore. I cannot, I cannot do this anymore. Maybe you're in a place where you have actually been diligently praying about something in your life for a very long time. And you haven't received the breakthrough. You might be sitting here tonight and you might be saying, but Sammy, you don't know my situation, my boy. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I've had to face. You don't know. You're right. You're right. You're 100% right. I don't know. But God knows, friends. God knows. He's calling out. He's calling out to his bride. And he's saying, come. He's saying, come. 
want this relationship between us to be restored. I want it to be restored. Come back to me. The book of Revelation says, this I have against you, that you have lost your first love. Go read the book of Hosea this week, friends. I, I beseech you to go and read the book of Hosea. Only a few chapters. And when you read through that word, allow the Holy Spirit to wash over your heart. That you can see that, you know what? There where we go wayward. God doesn't move away from us. He's an ever-present God. He's always there. He's always looking to restore the relationship between you and Him. Why? Why? Because He loves you. He loves you dearly. His word says, John 3, 16, For God so, so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. He so loved the world. That's you, friends. That's me. This evening, He's giving us another opportunity to come back to form that relationship. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I really do need you. Just as you sit there, let's just bow our heads. You've heard this message this evening and you, you're in a place where you say, but oh, I, want that. I want that relationship. I want it again. I want it with my God. I want to be in communion with Him. As I say, let's not overcomplicate it. Every single eye closed. No one looking around. Respect the moment. If you are at that place where you say, but I want to give my heart and my life to the Lord and I want to do it right now. I want that relationship to be stored. All you need to do is just to lift up your hand and say, Lord, I want to accept you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands. You can put them down. Thank you very much. For those of you who have lifted up your hands, I want you to pray this prayer after me, but every single person in this place that did not put up their hands are declaring tonight that you have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And therefore, as a family, I want you to pray, everyone, I want you to pray this prayer with us. Dear Lord Jesus, Father, I thank you for your love. And today I come and I want to confess that I am a sinner. But I want to ask that you will forgive me of all of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised Him from the grave and He is seated at the right hand of the Father and He's interceding for me. Lord, I invite you and I thank you for coming into my life now. In Jesus' name we pray.